Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm back with another week of meals for you on the Three Rivers Challenge. As always, I'm starting with my meal plan. You guys know I have a very detailed meal plan of all the breakfast, lunches, and dinners for the week. I also have a column for all of the prep work that I need to do each day as well as an ingredient list that I take down into the cellar with me to shop my pantry. And then after I'm done shopping, I bring everything up, I get out my inventory list and mark off everything that I remove from the pantry so that all of my tallies are updated and accurate. Let's get started with some meals. The first day of this week was David, my second son's 15th birthday, and he chose all of the meals. For his birthday breakfast, he wanted some cinnamon rolls, and I don't have yeast in the house for my usual cinnamon roll recipe, so I decided to make these sourdough cinnamon rolls, and I actually prefer these. They're a lot easier to make. They don't have a rise time. You can just make them and bake them, which is wonderful. As always, the recipe will be in the video description. I started with all my dry ingredients. We've got our flour, our sugar, our salt, baking powder, and baking soda. And then to that, I need to add some of my sourdough starter. This is what makes it a sourdough cinnamon roll recipe. I'm just using some discard here. And then we're adding our eggs. We added olive oil in place of lard. And then we're going to get that into our Bosch mixer and let that work the dough together for us. Now, in the meantime, we need to work on the filling for our cinnamon rolls. So I am just using six tablespoons of oil, some sugar, and some cinnamon. And we're gonna mix that all together and then get our rolls all rolled out. So like I said, my usual cinnamon roll recipe uses yeast. And so I have to prepare it the night before. It does an initial rise, you punch it down, You roll out your rolls and then you put them in the fridge and they rise overnight. This recipe, you can just roll your dough out like this and put your filling and then get it in the pan and bake it on 350 for about 25 to 30 minutes. And they rise just as if they sat in the fridge overnight. And I think that has to do with the fact that this recipe has the baking powder and baking soda in it. So it rises more like a quick bread. And it tastes just as amazing as my regular cinnamon roll recipes. So I love that I have this option on the days where I didn't do the prep work. I didn't think ahead and get it done the night before. So these are going to go into the oven for 30 minutes. And then we will work on some other items for breakfast. So I'm putting some bacon grease here into my cast iron skillet. This is my favorite way to make scrambled eggs. I love that it has the bacon flavor in it. I had actually made bacon the day before for breakfast and had saved some of that bacon for David since he wanted it on his birthday and then scrambled these eggs up in the leftover grease from um, Sunday's breakfast. So here are what the cinnamon rolls looked like fresh out of the oven. Now they need a glaze on top of them. So I make a really simple powdered sugar glaze. It's just a mix of powdered sugar here. We're going to add a little bit of vanilla extract and then I just add a little bit of water at a time until I get it to the texture that I like. So I like it to be just a little bit thick and then we're going to pour that powdered sugar glaze over the top of our cinnamon rolls while they're still warm and it'll kind of melt down and make these super delicious. So um, this was David's choice for his birthday, but of course all of the children are benefiting. They were very excited. We don't do cinnamon rolls very often. They're kind of a treat because they are so sugary, but they really did enjoy that. Now David is the baker in the house. Um, you guys know I've done lots of videos showing you David's treats. He's a very talented baker, and in previous years he wanted to make his own birthday cake. But this year I said, no, mom wants to treat you. I am going to make your birthday cake. So this is my basic birthday cake recipe, but I adapt it a little bit to make it dairy-free. I'm going to take you along and show you how I make that. So in my bowl there, I have three cups of flour, three teaspoons of baking powder, and two cups of sugar. Now to that, I need to add four eggs. I'm using water glassed eggs here. These are eggs we preserved from the abundance that we had last spring and summer, and it is wonderful to have these in storage. They're coming in very handy because um, we're maybe getting a dozen eggs a day 
from our hens right now. They really haven't picked up yet. Even though the days are getting a little longer, they're still not laying you know, a ton. So it's nice to have these to supplement what we're getting. Then I add one cup of olive oil. This is regular olive oil. You do not taste any olive flavor when you use regular olive oil. Don't use extra virgin. And then I'm adding a cup of orange juice in place of the milk in the recipe and a little bit of vanilla extract. So you can use any liquid for this. I just had orange juice in the fridge. I would sometimes use almond milk or cashew milk if I have it in the fridge. Any liquid works. Now, sometimes I'll just pour that cake batter directly into a 9 by 13 pan. Nothing fancy. But since David is my baker boy, I thought I'd do something a little special for him. This is how he likes to make cakes. So I'm going to try my hand at it. So I just traced my round cake pans onto some parchment paper and then I'm going to cut on the inside of that circle just to make sure none of the lead from that pencil ends up on our parchment paper and we are going to split this cake batter into these two round pans putting the parchment paper on the bottom of the pan really helps them come out keeps that um, cake from sticking to the bottom but then I also like to get a little bit of grease I use lard or palm fruit shortening get it on my hand and just kind of rub, rub that on the side of the pan as well so that that cake will just come out of the pan really easily when it's done baking. Now we have the oven preheating to 350 degrees. I'm gonna split this batter between the two pans and then this is gonna bake for about 35 minutes or so. Now, in the meantime, I need to refill that vanilla extract that I made. I actually make my own vanilla extract and just reuse this container from the store-bought vanilla that I originally bought probably five years ago. So we're going to pour some of that out. It's just made with vodka and vanilla beans. That jar, jar that I poured from has been brewing for probably a year or so. And I actually started a new batch in December and I have that big bottle going and we won't dig into that for probably another six months or so when the other little jar runs out. But you can never have enough vanilla extract. I always have multiple batches going in the kitchen. 35 minutes have passed and so I'm going to take a toothpick and just check the center of those cakes to make sure that they are done. And then we're going to work on getting these out of the pans and getting them cooling so that we can ice them. Now, dairy-free frosting that actually tastes good can be a challenge, but this is what I use. I like to use palm fruit shortening and powdered sugar in equal parts. So typically for a cake like this, I'll use two cups of each. And then I purchase off of Amazon this Capella brand buttercream flavoring. I know it is an artificial flavoring. Some people don't like to use that, but it really does give that frosting um, the flavor of a dairy-based frosting. So it, all it takes is just a couple little drops like that. It's really not a lot. And then I use the Bosch mixer and just whip it around until it gets really light and fluffy. And it's really delicious. As you can see, there's never a shortage of little ones <laughs> that like to lick the beaters for me. And then once our cake is cooled, we can work on frosting it with this. But first I need to kind of cut the tops off so that they're flatter and the cakes will sit nicely for frosting. David's cake is really the only cake in the whole year that I typically make anymore because he enjoys making cakes so much that he handles everybody else's birthday cakes in the house. And so I'm really out of practice. And to begin, I was never the best <laughs> cake maker to begin with. My cakes never turn out super pretty like David's do, but they get the job done and they're made with love. And I'm sure that David appreciates not having to make his own cake. He was actually busy on this day. He left the house with his older brother, Gabriel. They went on a little adventure now that Gabe can drive, and they wanted to go um, out to the store and purchase some fun things for his birthday. And so since he wasn't home to make his own cake, I had um, the opportunity to take some time and surprise him with this when he came home. So 15 candles on my boy's cake. I can't believe it. Time is a thief. It really goes by so quickly. One of my rules with the pantry challenge was that I was allowed to do a small grocery store trip to purchase any items that my children wanted to make their birthday meals. 
So I did go to the store to purchase a few things to complete the rest of the meals that David wanted for the day. That included a couple fresh vegetables. He needed some lettuce for tacos, some broccoli, and some celery for a veggie tray. And he also wanted some summer sausage that I'll show you for a snack spread for dinner. But with the tacos that I was making at lunch, I decided I wanted to make some guacamole. So I grabbed these freeze-dried avocados from last year. This is a great way to preserve avocados before they go bad. If you bought a big bag of them and they're starting to all go bad at the same time, just slice them and freeze dry them. And then all you have to do is rehydrate them. And I choose to rehydrate them with lime juice and a little pickled pepper brine. So instead of rehydrating with the water that we pulled out of it, it will rehydrate with these items and that will just flavor it. And then all we have to do after it sits here for... A little time it takes maybe 15 20 minutes for that avocado to soften enough so that you can blend it together I just use my immersion blender here and blend it together and it's kind of a guacamole like <laughs> item just some blended avocados with that pickled pepper flavor in the lime juice and so this is what he had for his birthday lunch he wanted these soft tacos with the guacamole pickled peppers taco sauce um, there was ground beef in there, and then, of course, the lettuce that he had requested. In lieu of a dinner for his birthday meal that evening, he just wanted a snack spread. It was a karate night, so he wanted to snack a little bit before he went to karate and then come home later and snack again. So these were actually store-bought chips from New Year's that were left over that I didn't have to purchase. They were down in the pantry. And then I made this veggie dip. Let me show you how I make my veggie dip. So I have one egg in my bowl here, and then I took a lemon. We still had some lemons in the house from our citrus order um, that we've been using up in January, and I'm just gonna take the juice of one lemon there. If I didn't have a lemon in there, I would use some apple cider vinegar in its place. So about two tablespoons of the acid of your choice, and then two tablespoons of yellow mustard, and then I add a little bit of salt here, and this is my basic homemade mayo recipe. I'm gonna add about a cup of avocado mayo. If I don't have avocado mayo, I'll use regular olive oil. Both of them make a good mayonnaise. I just wouldn't suggest using extra virgin olive oil. It just gives a really pungent olive flavor that I just don't find to be pleasant. But that regular olive oil is much um, less pungent and very mild in flavor. So with the immersion blender, you just blend it up to the desired texture. It will thicken like a store-bought mayo. But when I'm making a veggie dip, I like to leave it a little bit runny, and that's for a good reason. What I add to this is a veggie dip mix that I get in bulk from Azure Standard, and I will link it in the description. It's just a blend of herbs and spices, and it has some freeze-dried veggies in it too. So I do find that when that sits in the mayo over time, it thickens it. So if you start with a mayo that's too thick, then it isn't really fun to dip in. You want it to still be kind of a, a dippable texture. So I find that if you start with a watery mayo, and then let it sit with the freeze-dried veggies in there, it becomes the perfect texture. If it does get too thick, all I'll do is add a little bit of water to it and mix it around, and that works just fine. But this is my go-to veggie dip mix. You guys know my oldest son has anaphylactic allergies to dairy. We can't make like store-bought veggie dips out of sour cream or other dairy-based ingredients. So pretty much anything we make in this house that is creamy like this has this homemade mayo base and it works out wonderfully. So we make this a lot. We were making this like once a week over the holidays for various gatherings. And then since we still have fresh carrots in the house, this is what I'll make for snacks for the children quite often. Just cut up some carrot sticks, make some dip like this, and they really seem to enjoy that. So like I said, for David's birthday, we did have one bag of store-bought Lay's pickle chips. Those are my kids' favorite potato chips. Those were in the house left over from um, New Year's. But when we're out of chips, what we like to do is just make them from scratch ourselves. It's really easy. If you have a veggie spiralizer like I just showed, all you have to do is spiralize your potato chips. Get them cut as thinly as possible, and then you're going to deep fry them. 
We just rendered a bunch of lard last week and have it in the house. So we went ahead and filled our uh, pan up with a bunch of that lard. And then we're just deep frying those potato slices in the lard. And then as soon as they come out, sprinkling them with a good bit of salt. And it's a really healthy um, option for a potato chip. None of the questionable additives and preservatives of store-bought. It's just potatoes lard and salt, all of which are yummy and um, delicious for the children. So we've been snacking on this every once in a while. Sometimes we'll use regular potatoes. Sometimes we'll use um, sweet potatoes. So just because it's a pantry challenge, it doesn't mean that we're deprived of a lot of our favorite fun treats. Um, it just takes a little more effort and time to make them from scratch, but in the end it's worth it because they are healthier for us that way. All right, David's birthday was a success. We had so much fun celebrating with him. Why don't I show you the other meals that we made this week? The ones that aren't duplicates that I have shown in the other videos from the challenge throughout the month of January. So I'm just gonna be showing you some of the breakfast, lunches, and dinners that I have not shared with you yet this year. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you some more of our favorite snack options that we have been enjoying throughout the challenge. So we're low on fresh apples and we are out of fresh citrus like the oranges and grapefruit that we were enjoying in January, but that doesn't mean we don't have fruit in the house. The next best thing to fresh fruit and freeze fried fruit are frozen berries. You cannot have enough. And so I preserved about 70 pounds of blueberries last summer and I just portioned them out into containers like this in the freezer and we like to use these for smoothies and for muffins and all sorts of baked treats. Also, my kids will sometimes just snack on them <laughs> frozen. They love them that much. But the first breakfast I'm gonna show you is our blueberry muffin recipe. Once again, all of the amounts will be in the video description. But since I'm low on sugar, I'm gonna go ahead and use this apple. Um, it's a failed batch of apple jelly. I, you guys know I've been trying to use all of these up. There's enough sugar in that to sweeten the muffins. And then the liquid in that will replace the liquid that's in the recipe here. So just putting in those blueberries. I like to run them under some warm water to thaw them a little bit before I mix them into the batter. That makes for a better texture. We're gonna get these baking on 400 degrees for about 25 minutes. And in the meantime, I'm gonna make some cranberry juice for the children. So I only have about a third a cup of sugar down there in the bottom of my half gallon jar here. I've got some sleepy boys waiting for breakfast. They're being so patient. But what I need to do is strain the cranberries out of the juice here. I'm using two quarts worth of juice we will not waste these cranberries. Now there aren't a lot of nutrients left in these since they were heated and canned, but what I'll do is in my next freeze dryer batch, I'll throw these in there and then we can powder them down. They still have a really great cranberry flavor to them and that will be a wonderful addition to baked goods, not for nutrition necessarily, but for the flavor. So I've got my helper here working on stirring up the juice. Our muffins smell amazing and they're all out of the oven. We scrambled up some eggs. We have our cranberry juice ready to go. Just a really simple breakfast here that the children absolutely love. I like to play around with that blueberry muffin recipe and add other kinds of fruit. It works great with strawberries, raspberries, even um, apple slices. You can really substitute basically any kind of fruit into that and make a delicious muffin. So now let's move on to our next breakfast. I have some water glassed eggs here. I have some freshly ground wheat flour, and then we need a liquid to add to this. So I grabbed two cans of coconut cream from the pantry. We are gonna make what I call Walls of Jericho. If you've been around here for a while, you know what this is. It's essentially a Dutch baby. And we call it Walls of Jericho because sometimes the edges of it um, kind of rise up and then when you cut into it, the walls fall. So that's fun. Putting all the ingredients into the blender and adding some nutmeg and we're going to add a little bit of vanilla extract. I really don't measure with this, but I'll try to write out some instructions in the video description for you. I put it all in the blender and while it is thoroughly blending up, I'm going to work on making some blueberry syrup. 
So these are just some home canned blueberries in water. They're not sweetened yet. So I am gonna add a little bit of sugar to this and get it on the stove and let that kind of cook down into a syrup to pour over our walls of Jericho breakfast. Now it's time to get our batter into the pan. I just greased up a large cast iron skillet and it, the skillet is already hot. And then I'm pouring my batter into it and I'm gonna bake this in the oven on 400 degrees until it finishes. I don't really have a time for you. Usually it's about 35 minutes or so. And um, it kind of just depends, how long it takes depends on how deep your batter is, how big of a pan you used. But this is what it looked like coming out of the oven. My kids love this. And as you can see, when you cut it, it kind of starts to fall. It's funny how it'll come out in different shapes every time I make it. I think because I used the two cans of coconut cream this time, it was really rich and thick in the texture compared to times when I use other types of liquid, like a, um, a nut milk or something like that. And so it almost had a, a thicker texture in the inside, so it didn't rise on the edges like it usually does. But, oh, it was so delicious covered it in some powdered sugar a little bit of that blueberry syrup some of the kids like maple syrup they all like different things on it and this was our breakfast for this morning so when I don't use that canned coconut cream which I actually don't use very often because it can be rather expensive I like to make homemade dairy-free milks out of various nuts and so the most common nut that I will use to do that is cashews I like to use um, cashew pieces. They're a lot cheaper than the whole cashews and you can get them in bulk from Azure. Just add some water to my blender. Now, if this were gonna go in something sweet, I would add a date to this to make um, sweetened milk. But since this is gonna go in something a little more savory here in a bit, I did not add a date to it or any vanilla or anything like that. And then once I the blender has processed that, I'm just straining out any solid nut pieces that might be left behind, and I have a delicious cashew milk. I'm also going to grind down some wheat berries to make some flour for this next breakfast. I love that the pantry challenge is forcing me to use my wheat berries in my grain mill. Sometimes I just get lazy and I purchase bags of pre-ground flour out of convenience, and it's a shame because I have the wheat berries in the house and they're so much healthier for you. So we're going to make some biscuits today out of that whole grain flour and the cashew milk. And in place of butter, we are gonna use some palm fruit shortening. So you can have the recipe in the description. I like to use palm fruit shortening or lard in anything like this that you wanna kinda of have a flaky texture to. So just rolling out my batter here, and then I'm gonna use my biscuit cutter to cut those, and we are gonna get these on our cookie sheet. My biscuits bake on 450 degrees for about 10 minutes. And now I do notice that when you're using the whole grain flour, you do get a kind of a denser, um, heavier biscuit than if you're using an all-purpose flour or one that has been has had the bran sifted out of it, but it's still a really delicious biscuit. And with our biscuits, we're gonna have some sausage and gravy. So I have two pounds of sausage here that I've browned up. I'm just adding a little bit of homegrown sage powder to that and then pouring in that cashew milk. That is what we made the cashew milk for. Now, since this cashew milk is rather watery, we do need to thicken this up. And so to make this gluten-free, I like to use um, arrowroot powder. That is what I use for all of my gravies and pie fillings and things to make them gluten-free. And then just adding a little bit of maple syrup to give it a breakfast sausage feel and then letting that gravy cook. Now, some of the kids will also want jelly with their biscuits, so opening a jar of homemade crab apple jelly, and then most of the kids have half and half. They'll do a couple biscuits with the sausage and gravy, and then have a biscuit with the jelly on it too. So just because we can't have dairy in the house doesn't mean that we can't enjoy some of our favorite treats from the days of <laughs> long ago when we used to be able to have dairy. So I just try to adapt as much as I can and find delicious ways to make our favorite foods using nut milks and other items that don't contain dairy. It's been a challenge over the years to adapt my cooking in this way, 
but I like a challenge. Obviously, I'm I'm intentionally doing a pantry challenge right now. So I think it's fun to have to push yourself to the limits in the kitchen. It's a really um, it's a really rewarding thing to do for your family to try to feed them to the best of your ability, um, given all of the restrictions and things that you have. So enough of breakfast. Let's move on to some other lunches and dinners. So here is a dinner that we had this week. Ribs. You guys remember last summer I canned a bunch of this apple barbecue sauce and it is amazing. This is the first home canned barbecue sauce I've ever made that I actually like better than store-bought barbecue sauce. It is so good. It has that apple flavor. So I have three racks of pork ribs in the crock pot here and then I'm taking two pints of this barbecue sauce and just pouring it over the top and we're going to get those cooking in the crock pot all day. And then later that day, I needed to cook some sides, but actually I didn't need to cook them. They were already cooked through the canning process. So all I needed to do was open up jars and warm them up. This is why I love canning. It is so convenient. This is like the homesteaders version of convenience food here. So just getting a little bit more bacon grease here in a cast iron skillet. And then I just literally dumped those two jars of homegrown potatoes, cooked potatoes, into the bacon grease. We're going to fry them up a little bit to get them warm. Also dumped a jar of green beans and a jar of beets to be warmed up. And this is what we're going to serve with our ribs. Now I much prefer making ribs in the summer on the grill, but sometimes in the winter we have to make do. And to make it less messy, I pick all the meat off the bones for the little ones so they're not making a mess. But the older ones like to have um, the ribs intact like that and this is what their plates looked like so that is one meal we had this week let me show you another meal so really simple easy lunch I have some mayonnaise and um, sweet relish in a bowl and I also have some tuna here we are going to make tuna and noodles so I mixed all of that together added a little garlic and onion powder and salt and pepper and then I'm boiling some of this rice macaroni with some frozen peas and we are going to make a good old-fashioned tuna and noodles with the peas oh this is comfort food it reminds me of my childhood and since we're dairy free and we can't use like cream of mushroom soups we just use that same homemade mayonnaise recipe that i mentioned before served it with some hot cinnamon applesauce here's another really simple lunch that we made i have a jar of french onion soup base and two jars of our homegrown canned beef from the butcher. So what I like to do with that soup base is blend it together. This is so we don't have big onion chunks in our final meal here. So I add that blended soup base with one of our garlic pucks that is uh, pureed garlic in a little bit of olive oil. And then we are just going to dump these two cans of beef in there, kind of smash it down so that the chunks of meat are broken up. And then all of the tallow, that is the rendered uh, beef fat that's in the jar, is going to also melt down into this. I'm sprinkling in some homegrown parsley here, and then I boiled some um, noodles here. We're going to make a beef and noodle dish. Now after I added the noodles in, I decided it was a little too watery, so I have some freeze-dried raw tomatoes. These were just literally raw tomato slices that I freeze-dried and powdered up last summer and they smell amazing they smell like summer because the tomato oh i can't wait till we have tomatoes in the garden but putting those in there just absorbed some of the liquid and made it a little thicker and this is what we had for an easy lunch one time this week so yummy so i get asked a lot about snacks and what we do for snacks and i've shared some things here and there like the fresh fruits and carrot sticks and potato chips and stuff like that but let me show you some of our other favorites so something i like to do is just throw some dates into the food processor and it's pretty much different every time i make this but the base ingredient of this is usually some dates this is the sweetness and also the sticky texture that will help hold everything else together. And then I just start adding random nuts. This, these are some cashew pieces. I add um, sun butter, cashew butter, whatever kind of nut butter I have in the house. I'm adding some white chocolate chips, um, some cacao powder. I'll add dried fruit, raisins, added some macadamia nuts there. 
I think I'm going to add some applesauce because I had some on the stove cooking. Just anything like that that you want to add to it. It's like a trail mix that you're blending all together with your cashews. And then what I do is just grab a dish here and line it with a little bit of parchment paper. Now, sometimes I'll take the time to roll these into balls, like, an, and I call them an energy bite. And sometimes what I'll do is just spread this date mixture out onto the parchment paper and just kind of flatten it out a little bit. And then we're going to throw it in the oven just on 350 degrees for, it doesn't take very long, maybe 15 or 20 minutes just to dry it out a little bit so that we can cut it into some snack bars. And while that's happening, I'm working on some schoolwork with my son, David. We're gonna let those bars cool here and then we can cut them up. So it's just a nice little um, treat that isn't super unhealthy for them. There's not a ton of sugar and stuff in it. It's got some good protein in there, kind of an alternative to a granola bar, like a grain-free granola bar. So that is something that I make pretty frequently, like maybe once a week we try to get this in. My kids like to have snacks like this um, right before we start school because we have breakfast pretty early in the morning and then they want a snack um, in between breakfast and lunch. Another favorite snack you guys know I love to make out of my pantry staples is Jello, And you guys have seen me make little gummies out of this basic Jello recipe before. But sometimes I'll just save time and not putting it in the molds and we'll just pour it out into a pan. So for every cup of juice that I pour in, I put about three tablespoons of pastured beef gelatin into it. And the juice is usually sweet enough. There's no need to add honey or sugar. I just blend it together, warm it up slightly until that gelatin starts to dissolve, and then pour it into my dish here. And then we'll cover it, put it in the fridge, and it will set usually in about an hour or so. It's a really quick snack to make for the kids. And then, like I said before, I'll cut this up. And this is something that the kids will enjoy. Just a quick snack to kind of pick them up um, and get them through between breakfast and lunch while they're doing school. So just a little brain food to give them some energy and something um, to snack on. Besides that, we do a lot of trail mix. We'll do smoothies sometimes. If I didn't do a lot of baking for breakfast, sometimes I might make them cookies or uh, muffins or something like that. But yes, my kids do eat snacks we typically try to avo avoid store-bought processed snacks because they're so expensive, especially when you're buying them for um, eight children. And so we just like to make snacks that we can make from the items that we already have in our pantry. Our final snack I'm going to share is our family favorite. We have this every Sunday. So once again, putting some bacon grease into a pot. You guys know we love bacon grease <laughs> and we love to eat bacon. So I store my bacon grease in this grease pot. This is actually a grease pot that I designed with a friend who is a potter and I'm going to actually be um, helping her sell these in the next couple of weeks on Instagram. So if you follow me on Instagram, um, look out for that. This is the grease pot that we designed after Adam's grandma's grease pot from his childhood. So I've got my bacon grease in the bottom of my pan and we're gonna pour in popcorn. Now, if you have never had popcorn that is cooked in bacon grease, it is amazing. This is our favorite way to have it because you guys know we can't put butter on our popcorn. So um, the bacon grease kind of um, serves to give it a little bit of flavor. And then Adam's childhood favorite is to have apples with this popcorn. So you put the apple slices in on top of the popcorn and then you salt it all with the apples on top. So the apples get a little salty too. And so we have this every Sunday as a family and we watch America's Funniest Videos together on Sunday nights. This is just one of our family routines that we absolutely love um, to do together. So that is it for this week. We are one month down on the pantry challenge. We are now into month two, and I'm going to be bringing you lots more fun content throughout the Three Rivers Challenge here in the month of February. Make sure you check out the hashtag to see all of the other wonderful channels who are participating with me in this challenge. And I will be back next week 
with more meals and tips. And I'm gonna give you kind of a look at how we're doing in the pantry and what we're getting low on. This is when the fun begins. We're gonna start seeing lots more substitutions and creativity having to happen in the kitchen. See you next week, friends.